Hello, I'm Bill Whalen. I'm the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Distinguished Policy Fellow in Journalism here at the Hoover Institution, and I'd like to welcome you back to the Hoover Book Club, where we bring Hoover fellows and friends together to discuss their latest writings. Our guest today is my colleague, Marcos Kunalakis. Marcos is a Hoover Institution Visiting Fellow and a Senior Fellow at the Center on Media, Data, and Society at Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. He's also an award-winning nationally syndicated foreign affairs columnist and author. His columns appear weekly coast to coast in the McClatchy chain of newspapers. Marcos Kunalakis joins us today to discuss his latest book, Freedom Isn't Free, Price of World Order. Marcos, it's great to see you. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, Bill. And as a columnist yourself, I know uh, that this is something that's uh, that you're familiar with. And so to get a, a collection of columns, a curated collection of columns is is really pretty special. And I'm, I'm happy to be bringing them out into the world. Thank you. So before we get into the book, Marcos, two orders of business. Number one, besides calling you sir, do I call you the second partner, the second gentleman? What what tag are you going by these days? And explain that to our audience. Right. So I do have this other moniker. And uh, it's interesting. There were Wikipedia wars about whether I should be the second partner or the second <laughs> gentleman. So when my wife was elected lieutenant governor of the state of California, I suddenly had a new uh, role, one that I never run for. Uh, but one that I adopted. And so, uh, of course, Wikipedia tries to define who you are. And because the um, spouse of the governor, Gavin Newsom, uh, goes by the moniker of first partner, partner and that's, right. that's the first time that's happened, right? It's always been first lady, right. um, in part because she also has a role in government. Uh, I decided, well, then I should probably be second partner. And Wikipedia agreed for a while until the uh, first gentleman, or rather second gentleman uh, forces really took over. And so I am now going by second gentleman since that seems to be the consensus. Right. And in California, you're the other second gentleman, because of course, there's Doug Emhoff down in Southern California, who's married to Kamala Harris. Yes. So he would be the first second gentleman of the country, and I'm the first second gentleman of California. Okay, my head's swimming here. The other one, we're going to get Marcos, <laughs> I'd like you to explain to our younger viewers what that primitive instrument is over your right shoulder and that, um, that piece of paper over your left shoulder, uh, how that ties into your past life. Yes. Well, so this instrument, which you're pointing out, is actually something I used to type on. And uh, there are keys there, much like a keyboard. Uh, in fact, the entire uh, structure of a computer is based on this QWERTY keyboard. And the reason why we have this odd keyboard on our computers is because uh, there was actually a speed bump built into these old mechanical typewriters because if you could tap type faster, the keys would run into each other and stick. So they they messed up the keyboard and they didn't make it so that it was efficient, but rather something that actually would slow you down. Uh, so that's a typewriter and that's how we used to uh, write copy and uh, and give it to our editors. And to my left is a uh, a box, what we call the news box. They may still exist in your city. Uh, and in there, there would be newspapers that you could pick up on a daily basis. Uh, you put a, co a coin in, often, uh, most recently, a quarter. I think it's about, about up to a buck these days. And, uh, and you'd pull out a newspaper and you'd leave the rest of them in there so others could buy them. Yeah, I think if you, by the way, ever want to teach your children, Marcos, what hard labor is all about, uh, get them off their computer and tell them they have to turn in their high school paper on that typewriter. No spell check, no do-overs. <laughs> That's right. We were relying on something called liquid paper at best. Yes. Uh, later on, there was an invention called erasable paper. So you could actually get a <laughs> pencil eraser and then make and correct those mistakes. But all my college papers were done on typewriter. So and I'm sure yours too, Bill. Yeah, so my college days, not we'll get to the book here in a second. In my college days, Marcos, there was a healthy community of little old ladies near my college, all of whom made good money each year, writing, you know, just typing out people's term papers. Constantly. Right. Well, there you have it, you know. And so this is how we did it. And, and as you say, you know, it, the unique aspect of it is you really had to learn to edit in your head and before you hit the keys so that uh, because you didn't have the ability to move right. paragraphs in the same way. In fact, the way we would do it is we would... Right use scissors, cut into the paper, and then reposition it on another piece of paper. That's how we cut and paste. That is literally what we did, was we would cut with scissors and then paste them onto a piece of paper. But really, you, you had to uh, think quite 
quite hard. You, 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 it, it was a very different way of writing. You had to compose in your head before you really hit the keyboard. Exactly. And, uh, and it's, it's allowed, you know, these new technologies have allowed us to really sort of throw everything onto uh, a screen or, a, or an open document and, and then edit later. Uh, so I'm not sure which is better, but it certainly was a different practice. Yes. Uh, so let's go on to the book, Marcos, which I enjoyed very much. Your columns are just always really just uh, really well written. They're insightful. They're thought provocative. They're, they're terrific, what you'd expect of a Hoover fellow. Um, but your book, Marcos, appealed to the political nerd in me for this regard. One of my favorite presidents of all time is Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I've been to Hyde Park. I, uh, anytime I go to Washington, I, I like to walk by his memorial uh, in a tidal basin. Your book is Rooseveltian in this regard, Marcos. I'm referring to Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedom Speech in 1941. And maybe you're nodding your head. Maybe you had this in mind when you did the book. Franklin Roosevelt uh, appears before Congress January 6, 1941. He's making the argument that basically America has to stand up for Great Britain without getting in the wall, without getting in the war coming to their defense. And he gives a speech in which he outlines four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. So here we are 70, 72 years and three weeks later from FDR's speech, Marcos, and you're also covering the waterfront on freedoms. You also mentioned freedom of speech, freedom of worship, and freedom from fear. You added a few more though, freedom of thought, freedom to learn, freedom of movement, freedom from corruption, freedom from oppression, freedom through security. Let's quickly go through these and, and explain why you did these categories. So first of all, freedom of thought. So uh, it's as we develop, you know, and it's interesting because it, re it relates again to these technological changes that we've had. Suddenly we have the ability to monitor thinking, not just speech or organ organized um, uh, uh, abilities of us to organize in, in the streets, but actually thought, the types of thought that we then often share in times of so with social media. And, uh, and we also have new tools by which we can control that thought through technological means of nudges. For instance, it's a new term that allows us to sort of move along the way that we think. There's a new era of propaganda and of thought control that is, uh, that is possible through these new technological changes. So I think that in this 21st century environment where, where states have the capacity and the technology to actually manage our own thinking to either punish us for our thinking, whether it's if it falls outside of the bounds of what an authoritarian regime really prefers, or to be able to, uh, in fact, uh, amplify our thoughts and, and reward us for right thinking, correct ways of, of going about things. Uh, those tools are now available and they're very subtle and they, and they act upon us on a daily basis. So I wanted to, to call that out and to try to explore it a bit with, through my columns themselves. Okay, Marcus, another chapter of your book, FDR did not refer to this in 1941, but you did in 2022, Freedom to Learn. What is, what is freedom to learn? So, you know, what we found over time, you know, and this is in part uh, that some part of uh, modernization theory and the ability for states to develop into democratic participatory societies is that education becomes a very important part of how we evolve our democratic understanding, our civic engagement, and our citizenry uh, productivity, uh, those things that allow us to become wealthier societies that allow us to then uh, develop middle class society and to um, uh, then really be active participants in our societies, in our democratic right. societies. And so I wanted to look at the different ways in which uh, education plays a, a role. And it's not merely education writ large, you know, the, the idea of going to a university, but really education of young women. You know, we have uh, countries such as, Af as Afghanistan, which have suddenly allowed and developed through the intervention of the United States and, and allied forces to uh, develop educational institutions. Those are not givens in many parts of this world. And in fact, uh, they are restricted in other parts of the world. So I wanted to call that out as well as an important part of this development towards democracy. All right, speaking of restrictions, Marcos, freedom of movement. What is freedom of movement? 
So I used to live in uh, the Soviet Union. I used to live in Eastern Europe. And this was not because I chose to move to those countries uh, as preferable nations. It's because I was a foreign correspondent. And at the time, I worked for Newsweek. And then I uh, jumped ship and went over to NBC Mutual News when I moved to the Soviet Union and lived in Moscow. Anyone who's lived in these, uh, in these totalitarian states, in these captive states, uh, understands that movement is essential to uh, the health of a society, um, to the democratic development of any society. And so there, that it was one of the things that I felt that, that uh, we hadn't really talked about or often do not talk about. And so right. I found that in my columns, I was often referring to freedom of movement. Freedom of movement, for example, within Hong Kong, in a contemporary sense, the ability to actually be able to move with both within your society, but outside of your society, those things which are currently being restricted. So movement is important. Okay. And then finally, freedom from corruption. This is perhaps the one greatest limiting factor uh, in, in democratic development uh, in those societies where you have authoritarian leadership. Um, it's true in democratic society as well, but it's not as true in democratic society. And, that, and I'll point out the reasons. Um, corruption is the ability to actually start to monopolize the resources of a nation. And those can be the financial resources, those can be the material resources, but they can also be the human resources of a, na of a nation. And so what we pride ourselves in, uh, in our uh, in our democratic societies is the level of, uh, an, a high level of transparency that allows us to then call out corruption to identify it and then to correct and we we pride ourselves on having a, a self-correcting system that is not true in authoritarian states and that corruption tends to feed on itself and make a corrupt society even more corrupt now, if FDR were with us, he could have easily stolen the last three chapters of your book and attached those to his speech. But I guess the seven freedoms would be much too clunky. And my God, think of just how large of a boulder you would need to etch all the freedoms on it just to hold that. So four is easier than seven. But uh, the last three chapters of your book are freedom from oppression, freedom through security, and then finally, a free world. So let's now talk about 2022, Marcos, uh, versus 1941, freedom from oppression and freedom through security. What are you getting at here? So uh, the overriding uh, theme here is that freedoms don't come for free, right? There, that there are always trade-offs you are going to have to make. Right. And those trade-offs can be material trade-offs or they can be in terms of your civil liberties, your, mm -hmm. your rights. And we make those choices every day and we make them personally, but we also make them as a society. Right. And, and so that's, that really addresses the question of freedom through security. We decide as a nation, for instance, that we're gonna spend nearly $800 billion a year on our defense department. Uh, it is a huge amount of money that we allocate for our security in the United States and also for our forward uh, leaning military to be able to actually help other nations secure their freedoms through our partnerships in, in, uh, in alliances such as NATO, uh, in AUKUS now in, uh, with the Australia, United Kingdom and United States Alliance. So, um, that is not that is a very expensive way to maintain uh, our freedoms, but it's also one that we found as a society is necessary. So I go through various ways that we make trade offs on, our, on, on both a daily basis and as a society to maintain those freedoms. Let's talk now, Marcos, about Ukraine and uh, what it means vis-a-vis -vis this concept of freedom. Uh, you wrote a column for the Los Angeles Times in which you point out quite interestingly that one of the challenges here with Ukraine is that Ukraine entered an agreement back in the 1990s with Russia in which it gave up its nukes. But in exchange for giving up its nukes, it was given the guarantee of security. Looks like a bad deal now in retrospect. We did an episode of Goodfellows here at the Hoover Institution the other day, Marcos, and our guest was Andrew Sullivan, who was a very provocative thinker in many regards. And he sparked a very, very spirited conversation when he said the following. He said that, you know, when we look at Russia, when we look at Ukraine, why don't we let Putin have it? Because this is basically his sphere of influence. So that's my question to you, Marcos. What is really at stake when you look at Ukraine and you look at Putin's designs, both on that country, but also Eastern Europe? 
Right. So there are a number of people, in particular those who haven't lived there and maybe don't have a stake in that in that region, uh, who see it as something far away, who uh, try to apply to Russia the same sort of concept that we have in the United States of the Monroe Doctrine, the idea that you actually should have buffer states and spheres of influence. And this is a very 19th century approach to how we should think about uh, our nation states. But if you are truly one who feels that freedoms should be inherent, that they are part of our uh, uh, God-given nature, then you should want to actually expand those freedoms. And, and whether you do it um, through your concept of your ideas or in some instances through active defense, uh, then, then those are the trade-offs that we should consider making. And so I, I'm one of those who actually does feel very close to Central Europe. Uh, as you know, Bill, and I'll let uh, those viewing know, uh, my wife, before she became Lieutenant Governor of the state of California, was the United States Ambassador in Hungary, uh, part of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, a nation that was a captive state during the Warsaw Pact days when the Soviet Union really dominated the region, next door to Ukraine. Right. And these are people who are who who are in every way uh, the same as we are. In fact, perhaps even more educated than we are and perhaps more productive than we are in many ways. Right. And so um, I, I really bristle at the idea that we just let another nation uh, have its authoritarian way with another country. It's, it's, it contradicts what we all agree in the international community and the United Nations regarding the sovereignty of borders. It says, you know, these people are lesser, that we, they should, we should allow them to then be, uh, you know, ruled by an overlord uh, in another nation, in another state from another capital. And that, uh, and it really just sort of uh, is bothersome in almost every way that, um, that we give up. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned my Ukraine piece, and we can talk about that because, so, uh, one of the things is it didn't have to be this way. Right. And uh, at one point, not that long ago, Ukraine had a bargaining chip, a significant bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. And that bargaining chip was nuclear weapons. weapons. Right. Right. So at the end, yeah. Yeah. And in your Times piece, what you point out to, I hadn't thought about this, it was just really a brilliant observation on your part. There was a message to other countries. And that is if you have nukes, why give them up? You know, put yourself in a position of weakness. And also, as you posit, that if you don't have a nuke, maybe it's a good time to go get one. Yeah. And so I, I hope that's not, uh, so I don't want that to be the lesson, right? In no, fact, no, you're, you're, you know, you're not encouraging it, but you're just saying that, you know, actions have consequences. And a consequence might be that some country that feels threatened might feel the need for a WDM, WMD, some need of deterrence. That's exactly right, Bill. And so what we want to do, both in the United States, but in the Western world, is actually make Ukraine a, an example of why you do want to give up, why you do want to enter into arms control, or why you do want to give up your weapons. And, you know, and so uh, we don't want to make it a, a lost cause. We want to make it a good example of why uh, giving up, entering into disarmament agreements can be a positive thing. But, but as we look at Ukraine these days, and as we see the border buildup and, and the threats from Russia, to Ukraine, the opposite lesson is one that others will take away. Why on earth then would Iran or North Korea give up its nukes if in fact what, what you will then invite is both, uh, it, you will have a less, less of a deterrent and you will invite the potential for intervention and per perhaps even uh, uh, invasion into your country. So, uh, so my, arg my argument in that Times piece was really let's, let's help Ukraine because uh, those nations that we know of that have given up their nuclear weapons are in worse shape in terms of their sovereignty than they may have been if they had held on to those. And so, so the two nations that I mentioned, uh, which are all also relevant because they are now uh, responsive to uh, Moscow's and, and Putin's uh, actions and his interests are Belarus, where Lukashenko is now really 
must basically answer to anything Putin wants. And the other one is now Kazakhstan. Both of these nations had demonstrations recently. Both of them were put down by forces that were loyal to Moscow or in fact, perhaps Russian troops, at least in Kazakhstan, they were Russian troops on the ground, stopping the demonstrations, killing people. Very good. Um, let's uh, tie into your final chapter, Free World, and let's talk a bit about China, Marcos, which uh, has uh, sort of left the front burner. It's on the back burner at the moment because Ukraine has our attention, but there's the ongoing question of what China is going to do vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Every few days brings some episode of saber rattling. Chinese planes fly to Taiwanese airspace. We send carriers through the, through the Formosa Strait and so on and so forth. Uh, explain China's role, Marcos, in the concept of a free world moving forward. So this is the greatest challenge in our contemporary world. I mean, while Russia may be threatening a regional, on a regional basis, those freedoms, China really is threatening uh, the freedoms on a global basis. They would like to rewrite the rules of the road for right. our international system and the international order. And so, uh, and it, by the way, this is something that was identified not, not recently, I mean, it started, uh, in the Obama administration, it continued and perhaps even gained strength during the Trump administration. And it's right. something that, of course, has become now ideological in the Biden administration. Uh, so, so for the last few administrations, we have recognized the rise of China as a threat to the international order, rules-based order that, that the United States has really been in, uh, leading. Um, and which the United Nations and other international bodies have been uh, trying to defend. And so um, you'll see in the book that I, I talk an awful lot about China. And, um, and so to think about a free world, we really have to think about it in competitive terms. Uh, I was gonna say that China has now been drawn into this competitive framework in the Biden administration, which is very ideological. During the right. Trump administration, in some ways, it was somewhat transactional. You and I have a colleague now who was in the Trump administration, who was deputy director at the National Security uh, Council in the White House, M Matt Pottinger. And he too points out, in fact, was, was very astute in saying that we have now made it an ideological battle. Because right. when Joe Biden, President Biden talks about um, China or other nations, he talks about the, com the competition as being between democracy and autocracy, very clearly drawing that line, as opposed to being somewhat malleable and allowing for, say, trade policies to dictate our foreign policy. This is now, the battle lines have essentially been drawn during this administration. I think the Chinese would like to back off from that, but I think we are now seeing that the United States is is promoting a case of, are you with us or against us on this front? Yeah, I'm curious, have you thought much, Marcos, about the Olympics? Uh, China holding the Winter Olympics, China uh, held the um, Summer Games uh, in the century as well. Is there a parallel or analogy to what happened in 1936 with the games being played in Berlin and that the world is supposed to come to this country and get along as one? But that means you have to turn your back on a lot of bad things that are going on. Yeah, so it's interesting. So I was at that 2008 Olympics, and uh, I sat in I sat in the front row, uh, facing uh, the leadership and watching uh, President Bush come into that, and 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 really being overwhelmed by the spectacle and the scale of those games. And that truly felt to me as if it, it had a 1936 parallel. It was really China's coming out party. Everything symbolically represented the, the fact that China was no longer rising, but that it had arisen and that it was now, in its own mind at least, uh, at parity with the United States considering itself a great power. And so everything since then has sort of been building. And, uh, and I think these Olympics are not going to have that character in part because it's the Winter Olympics and uh, you know, it's not everyone in the world participates with the exception of maybe the Jamaican bobsled team and a few others that don't sort of come from the Southern part of the world, but it's also gonna be the pandemic Olympics. So there's, you know, you're gonna have an Olympic games with virtual crowds and, you know, who knows how many athletes uh, 
and no diplomatic representation. So they're not going to be able to have that level of spectacle this time. Uh, I think more what it's going to represent is going to be a, a pause in some of their more aggressive act, actions uh, right. in the world and, and maybe just a time for them to reassess both the Biden administration and the global sphere, uh, looking for opportunities, testing the temperature and, and maybe having some side summit meetings with those leaders who do show up in Beijing to uh, to meet with uh, Xi Jinping. Right. Since we talked about uh, Putin and the theory of sphere of influence, Marcos, let's turn closer to home and let's look at the United States of America and the theory of Mare Nostrum, that the Caribbean is our ocean, our backyard, if you will. You write for the Miami Herald, so I know you've written often on these topics. I think we did a podcast on this a few years ago about Venezuela. Let's look at Cuba and let's look at Venezuela and let's talk a bit about those nations moving forward. Uh, there would have been a time not long ago when you and I would have been talking mostly about Venezuela on this conversation because it was the forefront of American politics policy, if there was such a thing as a betting market on where an American is going in terms of troops and military intervention, we might have pointed to Venezuela. Nobody talks about Venezuela right now. We talk about Ukraine, we talk about China, but we've forgotten about that. And we've certainly forgotten about Cuba, it seems as well. So you look at those two countries, which struggle in all sorts of ways, economic in terms of human interest, human restrictions, what's going to happen there? So uh, you're right, Bill. And part of the reason that we talk about Cuba at all right now is that Putin is threatening to move missiles into our sphere of influence, right. uh, Cuba and Venezuela. And we know for a fact that Putin also has troops uh, in Venezuela, or at least advisors, who are working with Nicolas Maduro to make sure that he remains in power. Uh, Russia's interest extends to Venezuela for very other for another very important reason. It's an oil producing nation. And so Putin is doing his best to build relations with those other oil producing nations. And remember, Venezuela began OPEC. They were the initiator of, of the cartel, uh, the oil cartel. So um, he is trying to figure out how to monopolize and manage the energy supply in the world to keep energy prices up, to make sure that he has his finger on the pulse of the control of the energy uh, realm within the world. So what happens in Cuba and Venezuela? Cuba, of course, is important for us, not merely because of its proximity and its relationship to, you know, its long relationship with the United States, uh, but because presidential candidates are really concerned about what happens in Florida and with that constituency, because they oh. are rabidly anti-communist for good reason, because yes. many of them are exiles, both from Cuba and from Venezuela. In fact, I would say that Miami, where I got to read the daily paper because I write for the Miami Herald, is the capital of Latin America in many ways. It is where a lot of the wealth resides, a lot of the intellectual capital resides, and it is our jump off point for our policy and our, and our domestic relationship to that area. Um, so do I expect that something may happen in Cuba? Yeah, I mean, something better happen with Cuba. It's, you, you know, as far as our, our orientation, it, you don't hear a whole lot about um, normalizing relations in the Biden administration because it's a political loser. Um, right. There was an opportunity during the uh, Obama administration to have played this right, and I think they played it wrong. I think he, when they normalized relationship with relations with Cuba, they did it during the administration. There, there is a lame duck period between the election in November and January, where in the second administration of any presidency, where you can do really hard things and sort of allow the next administration to adopt those or reject those policies in, in very, but the Obama administration did it much, much earlier, allowing it to be a political football and really helping the, uh, the uh, opposition candidate at the time, Donald Trump, win over Florida in part because of the Cuba policy. No, you no I was gonna say one thing about Venezuela, I, I've become very, very good friends uh, and we talk regularly with uh, the opposition leader in exile, Leopoldo Lopez. Yes. Um, he is he's an exile in Madrid, uh, but he is working right now with a group of other leaders in exile uh, or who are opposition leaders from Iran, people like Gary Kasparov and others 
right. who are really fighting for freedom, knowing that freedom isn't free because many of them have spent time in jail trying to uh, promote freedom and democracy in their own nations. Uh, he is hard at work to try and put together a group of individuals who will uh, develop an allied group to, to promote this concept and to actually have throw weight so that it's not just on a nation by nation basis that we talk about freedoms that appeal to, you know, one group of ethnic individuals or others, you know, you don't want just Cuban Americans fighting for Cuban freedom and democracy, you want them to be able to actually join along and, and fight for freedom everywhere, where it's, whether it's in Iraq or Syria or Venezuela or North Korea, and the same for Venezuelans and others. So. It, what, what Leopoldo is trying to do is, is organize and work with these other opposition leaders to create the throw weight for a more uh, globalized uh, movement to, uh, to promote freedom and democracy. Right. So, Marcos, one way to look at Cuban communism is it's about to become a senior citizen. We're approaching the 65th anniversary of uh, Castro's rise. Uh, Soviet communism, Soviet oppression was a senior citizen when it finally collapsed. I think the Soviet Union lasted about 75 years, if I'm not mistaken. You look at a country like Cuba, Marcos, which um, has been in the business of denying basic freedoms to people for that long. And when I talk about that, I mean freedom of movement. You can't come and go to Florida as you like. Uh, freedom of information. You can't get access to the internet at times and so forth. How long, what does history suggest to us, Marcos, about how long a population will tolerate a lack of freedom? And if you're sitting in Washington, you're figuring how to kind of juice this along, how do you introduce freedom to the Cuban people? Do you do it in terms of trying to give them access to Wi-Fi? Do you do it in terms of introducing capitalism and giving them goods and services? How, how would you go about this? So Cuba, of course, has a long history of our failed attempts. And, right. and so it's a little harder, right? Because once you try to do it with military intervention, uh, with what they call el bloqueo, you know, the, the blockade, as they say, but, you know, we're, we sort of prevent certain goods and, and capital from getting down there. Um, you've provided the, uh, the authoritarian leadership with the tools to, uh, to sort of uh, fight uh, intervention in any way, whether it be intellectual intervention or physical material intervention. And so it's unfortunate because we do have this really bad history with Cuba to uh, come up with subtle and effective means. I, I think that the arc of history is on our side, uh, but, uh, but in many ways, whatever happens there will have to be domestically driven and in whatever way we can surreptitiously support this, because I don't think any overt uh, effort is going to be helpful. I think, in fact, it will have the opposite effect. But when those when those demonstrations do arise, we have to be able, as a not just the United States, but with the U European Union nations that are allied, like Spain, which have diplomatic relations, all of us have to then say, look, these people are just fighting for basic principles of freedoms, for basic rights. We have to coalesce and support them. Uh, on an international basis. And, and, and that is going to be the hard thing. If, if we hadn't had this history, I think there would be other tools, but, but we're limited in the United States. Right. So, Marcos, in your epilogue, The Challenge to Freedom, you talked about the attack in Paris on the uh, editors and writers of Charlie Hebdo, which was about seven years ago, I think now. And a few weeks before that, the um, the controversy over the movie The Interview, this was the uh, the, the comedy about uh, Kim Jong-un, who was not amused by it because in the movie he is assassinated in a quite gory way. Um, this then led to Sony Pictures being hacked, which we think by the North Koreans. And the point you raise is that we're in this world now where there's just a lot of anger, a lot of toxicity in our culture. I'm curious now, let's look at the United States. Um, a year ago, Marcos, there was uh, an attack on the Capitol, an attack fueled by one concept, stop the steal. In other words, the election results were bogus. We now have the opposite of that in 2022, the other side saying that the November results could be bogus as well. How is a democracy, Marcos, are we going to move forward if we have such basic toxic language as don't trust the election results? Yeah, so I think toxicity has existed throughout the history of right. the United States. What, what I think is different is that we are in this very globalized environment where the threats are very real from our, our, our opponents and our adversaries. 
And right. what, what weakens us as a nation and, and our ability to promote freedom and to uh, promote democracy is that we are so split and so violently split in this nation. I mean, it's, it's nearly a 50-50 split. And so we don't have the ability currently to coalesce around really basic issues. You know, this, I'm not even talking about freedom and democracy here. I'm talking about whether you should take a vaccine or not. Right. And so um, this is the type of thing that our colleague, uh, and we're very lucky to have him at the Hoover Institution, General Mattis, says, look, if we can't get our house together at home, right. how do you expect to actually be able to do anything in the world? And, and this is perhaps the greatest challenge. And, I, and I'm glad you ended up on this point, Bill, because it really is the greatest challenge for us as a nation, but also because of our role in the world. We are still looked upon as the beacon of freedom and democracy, despite our problems, despite the challenges and the, and the internal divisions of our nation. All you have to do is go to a, any other nation and look at which embassy has people waiting outside of its doors to get a visa. It is, the, people are still dying to vote with their feet to come to this nation. Right. And so we have to return to fulfilling that promise. And I'd say at the very least, we have to agree on how we conduct ourselves, the nation, the United States, in the world, and how we can how we manage our foreign affairs. Right. Our former colleague George Schultz uh, really was a promoter of this bill, and he often talked about not just that trust is the coin of the realm, meaning that our leadership, what they say, has to be trustworthy, but that our foreign policy was nonpartisan. He would not say bipartisan. He would say it was nonpartisan. If you look today, you know, and, and this will be true, you'll see that even our policy towards how we should perceive of Russia, right. your, your example of what Andrew Sullivan said is a great example. There are people on, on both sides of the Democratic and Republican side of the House who feel that maybe for, for different reasons, some because they feel ideologically aligned with Putin or they feel that we shouldn't be interventionist, others because we they feel that we should be really isolationist in our, in our approach uh, towards foreign policy. But whatever the reason, we do not have today a singular approach to some of our greatest adversaries in the world. And by the way, they're not making it any easier. They are fueling the fire of division within our nation. And you see that through their social media approaches, through their propaganda approaches, through their industry, through business interventions, any number of ways to try and change the conversation, to increase the divisions and the schisms within our own society, while also creating the divisions of approach towards our foreign policy. And that is unique in these days, in this 21st century, fueled by technology, exacerbated by our adversaries, and unfortunately, a reality that we have to deal with on a daily basis. I'm going to offer you a optimistic note here, Marcos. In 1976, approximately 25% of the world's nations were democracies. Uh, the last time I checked right now, about half of the world's nations are democracy. So you can argue freedom is on the march. Now the bad news. According to the World Bank, global extreme poverty rose in 2020 for the first time in two decades. Three reasons why the World Bank claimed Marcos all, they all begin with the letter C. One is COVID. The second is conflict. And the third is climate change. So here we are now, nearly 75% of the world's population lived in a country that faced deterioration last year, Marco. So assuming at some point we get COVID under control, what, how do we move forward in terms of trying to rectify this issue of deterioration and also trying to enhance freedom? Um, well, I'm glad you at least, uh, you know, thank you for those statistics, Bill, because it's, it's something that our colleague Larry Diamond, who is also at the Hoover Institution, I call him the doctor of democracy, okay. talks about a great deal. And he puts it in the frame of there is a democracy recession right. uh, and that, that some of these challenges that you've mentioned are, in fact, feeding this, uh, this uh, recession. But uh, I'm optimistic, and, I, and I've always been optimistic. It's part of the reason that I've written this book. And if you read through my columns, I think you'll find that they always do um, side and fall on the side of optimism, because I really believe that, that uh, humans and, and citizens 
really opt for freedom, rights, liberty, and democracy, uh, right. given, given the opportunity and given the conditions. And so it's a question of how do we fight for those conditions? And, uh, and if you follow Larry's frame and his, his framework of calling it a recession, well, that means that we're maybe in a business slump, you know, that in fact, these things are cyclical, but, it, but at the end of each cycle, we see a rise to a new higher plateau. It's going to be a little more challenging with China. The bets we've made on China in the past have not paid off. We thought that if we, if we played nice and we invited them in and we allowed their economy to flourish, that there was a way for that, that the natural progression would be that with economic development, there would be democratic development. We're finding that's not the case. We'll see as these COVID and other challenges that you've brought up, climate change and the like, exacerbate globally whether or not their leadership can manage these crises because i don't know if you've been to beijing lately but the last time i was there and i was there for the belt and road conference uh during the trump administration i could barely breathe i could barely see down the street and so uh you know we may we may be moving forward in the united states to try and improve our environment but if china doesn't play ball their their own citizens are going to have to are going to revolt in some way to deal with the very real challenges that come about because they do not have a voice in their government. Right. I'm glad you met, uh, mentioned Belt and Road, Marcos, because when we look at China, if you ascribe to another one of our colleagues, Neil Ferguson, his theory that this is Cold War II, that essentially we and China are now locked in a in a struggle. Of competition, you can view this in three regards. One is our governments, our respective governments. The Chinese will look at us, and I'm, well, I bring this up the context of how you sell nations to other countries. If you want to, if you want to put your money on China, put your money on the United States. The Chinese will say, "Look at the Americans. Look at the way they run their government. Look at these messy elections they have. They don't have legitimate leaders." Secondly, they will point to they will point to the economy what they do versus the United States. And then thirdly, they'll talk about how they invest in other nations versus the United States. So it seems to me the question moving forward, Marcos, is number one, how do we ideologically sell our country to other people? Um, tell them that contrary to what you may see and believe, we are not that way. But then second, second, our economic competition, which raises the question, Marcos, of what our role is going to be in the world. And I say this at a time when Americans, A, are tired of COVID and B, tired of just getting over forever wars. So to sell people on, we have to get involved in Kazakhstan. I don't mean militarily, but just we know how to get involved in their affairs. Whereas Andrew Sullivan was saying, why should we necessarily care about Ukraine? It's a tricky message for the American leaders to tell the people this country matters, this right region matters. So how as a leader do you sell that to the American people that these overseas investments are important? Right. So I think both the Trump administration, actually Obama, Trump and Biden administrations got this one right, which was we have to figure out how to share the burden. For too long, the United States has been solely responsible for a lot of the defense uh, of, of the world. For too long, the United States has been the sole um, underwriter of a lot of the economic development, both in our, ally, in our allied nations and in other parts. And, and we did this through open free trade agreements, you know, and ones that were not favorable to the United States. There were parts, uh, sectors that benefited, but, but overall, they, they were not positive. They helped those countries develop. They helped them establish stronger democratic uh, structures within their own countries. But, you know, they weren't spending their money to do it. We were, in fact, their, their sugar daddy. And so, uh, so I think, um, you know, sharing, figuring out how to make that burden sharing real is a big part of this, both to be able to make it more effective. In other words, for example, in the, in the European realm, making sure the European Union does, uh, and within NATO, that the Europeans are able to uh, defend themselves and support and help Ukraine. Right now, we're finding that it's only a portion of them and that others are actually undermining efforts to help Ukraine. Um, so, so on the one hand, it, it's to help them uh, and their own nations be more, uh, be stronger. But secondly, it's a great message to sell to the American people, which is, look, we recognize we've really extended ourselves in the past, and we're not going to do it in the same way any longer. So I think that 
that you know I'm focusing on the defense side, but also on the economic side, and and that is part of how you sell that message. And it's also what we need to do because, as I as the uh, driving principle of this book, uh, freedom isn't free, is you know there are trade offs, and what you're asking me is how does a political leadership in the United States sell the American people on the types of trade-offs we need to make without necessarily rising to the moment of crisis or war. And that's what we usually find in the past. There was a moment during the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration and 9-11, when 9-11 hit, which was a, a moment that, uh, that we consolidated as a nation. We were prepared to do whatever it took right. to fight back. The, the answer was, don't worry about it, America. We've got it covered. We're going to go do this. Go shop. And it was a moment that could have been taken advantage of in a very different way. Um, it's rare you get these moments. Uh, sometimes they're manufactured, uh, but sometimes, unfortunately, they arrive on our shores uninvited. And so does the Biden administration or the next administration uh, have a crisis that is very real that forces us into this moment of recognizing what it is we need to sacrifice as a nation mm -hmm. um, to be able to continue to promote our freedom? Or right. can we have the type of world that in fact rises up to the challenge and recognizes their own investment in this as, as existentially necessary? And I'm hoping it's the latter. Let me offer one final thought to you and uh, get your ideas on this, uh, Marcos, and that is uh, another category of freedom, and that would be freedom to the, come to the United States and check it out for yourself. Uh, I'm thinking of some I words in particular, Marcos, inclusion, immigration, and immersion. For example, Kunalakis, I'm guessing, is not a Native American name. At some yeah, point, Irish. <laughs> yeah, it's Irish. It's my second guess. <laughs> At some point, a Kunalakis came to America and made his or her way in, into this country and rose to where you are today. I'm curious, Marcos, if part of promoting freedom does not include some thoughts about we need to look at immigration in terms of bringing more people into our democracy and enjoying our freedoms. Secondly, inviting more people to come to our country, maybe study, do transfer programs and so forth, just see America for yourself. I grew up in a family where we had a lot of Peace Corps uh, kids come from Africa, South Africa in particular, and they had experience the United States. And yes, yeah, this is kind of simplistic, you know, take people into a grocery store and so forth. But when people come to this country and they see for themselves just how easy living we are, it does change your attitude. So maybe this is part of the freedom question moving forward, the temptation to be inclusive, that maybe we have to, the temptation, rather than shutting ourselves out from the rest of the world, that maybe we need to bring more people in here and do a better job of promoting ourselves that way. Uh, Bill, I, I agree with you. And in fact, it's not just I, it's, uh, it's George Schultz used to talk about the enormous benefit of immigration to this country. And so, um, you know, so let me back it up. My background, both my parents were refugees to this country. Uh, I was lucky because we came to California and educational opportunity existed. My wife, who, as you pointed out, is a lieutenant governor, um, her father was a refugee to this country. So three of our four uh, parents were refugees. Um, neither of my grandmothers learned to read or write. My wife's grandmother did not know how to read or write. And so in one step, because of the educational opportunities in California, we both were able, well, I got my doctorate and I got to be a journalist and she got to be Lieutenant Governor of California and an ambassador. Enormous social mobility thanks to this nation. And I think that anyone who comes here recognizes that while we're not necessarily representative of everyone who enters this nation, we certainly are an example of the opportunity and the possibility of what can be achieved in this nation. Um, there are two things I wanna say, one about immigration and then one about uh, inclusion and, and educational opportunity in this country. I'll start with the education. I used to be, President Obama appointed me to the Fulbright uh, board, the Fulbright Scholarship Board, which is run right. by the State Department. There is no greater benefit to this nation than bringing smart, hardworking people into this country to study, to learn our society, to go to places like Western Kentucky and Kansas State 
and right. really see what this what this nation is about, who makes it up, what our people think, and and how truly generous and wonderful uh, the people of the United States are. Um, Tom Friedman, the uh, columnist for the New York Times, once said that with every degree that um, is handed out in the United States, we should staple a green card onto the back of it so that those people uh, have a path to both enter and be productive within our society. We've got difficult immigration politics in this country, which would make that very difficult. But, uh, but I think were something like that possible, I would be supportive. The, the immigration question gets so convoluted because of this question of how do we control our immigration? Every right. nation needs to control its immigration policies. And, and I'm all for, uh, you know, if you wanna find a, a way to sort of get people to wait in line in autocratic nations outside of the US embassy, expand our lottery system, you know, just say, okay, anybody who right. wants to be part of this lottery system to come in, and, and they're, they'd spend much more time trying to get on that lottery than they would in the lottery that would get them a little bit of a few rubles in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, so we haven't figured this problem out. It's a complex problem because of the politics of immigration and the size of our border. But, uh, but I couldn't agree with you, George Schultz or Tom Friedman more mm -hmm. that, that the key to this nation has always been managed uh, but oh, but 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 welcoming immigration that allows for us to continue to bring in new ideas, new people, uh, adding to the diversity and to the greatness of this nation. So, Marcos, after you publish, you now have to promote. So, in this kind of weird COVID, post-COVID, kind of over it, still have to be careful about travel. Uh, how much promotion do you actually get to go on the road versus uh, interminable Zoom calls like this one? Yeah, almost none. <laughs> uh, no, it will be a, a series of Zoom calls, but you know we have uh, great colleagues at Hoover who also said, you know, if you want to promote your book, you should write some opinion pieces. So, as you noted, I wrote one for the LA Times. I'm uh, I'm in the process of write, writing one right now about golf and democracy. Uh, oh. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I love doing in my pieces is to be able to bring foreign affairs home in a relevant way and you know you it's not the thing that people pick up their newspaper or go to their website to go to first they're you know foreign policy and foreign affairs is so distant that uh it's always a challenge but it's one that i love meeting uh is how do you bring the most complex and distant issues that affect us at home how do you bring them home and how do you make them relevant so if I'm going to talk about, you know, freedom of expression, I'll talk about Beyonce and, and how she, for instance, uh, really uh, is, is symbolic of the type of creativity that we have in this country. So uh, golf and democracy, uh, I haven't started writing it, but it's on my mind. It is how I'm going to bring a certain level of democratic uh, discussion to uh, my compatriots and my readership. Okay, so moral of the story, if you want to live free, put a ring on it. <laughs> That's exactly right, Bill. That's the extent of my Beyonce news, uh, music camera. <laughs> hey, Marcos, thanks for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy your mostly virtual book tour. Thank the you. The Marcos Kunalakis' book is Freedom Isn't Free, The Price of World Order. It's available online, including that gigantic website named after a river in South America that sells books. If you want to follow Marcus on Twitter, he is on Twitter. His Twitter handle is, I'm going to take a deep breath here, at Kunalakis M. And you spell that, ready, here we go, at capital K-O-U-N-A-L-A-K-I-S, capital M, at Kunalakis M. Did I get that right, Marcos? Yes, you did. Thank you, Bill. Hey. You can also subscribe to the Hoover Daily Report, post Marcos commentary and interviews. You go to Hoover's website to do that. That is hoover.org. Click on the publications tab. Go to where it says Daily Report. Subscribe. Anytime Marcos writes or has some deep thought about something, you will get it. For the Hoover Institution, I'm Bill Whalen. Thanks for watching today. Thanks for watching the book club. Take care. Thank you.